Yeah, hello. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, people are just joining us now on the Zoom call and um, we're letting people in. Thank you for your patience. Those have been who were super prompt and been waiting. Um, I hope the <laughs> extra time you had for yourselves was uh, useful. Um, we've also got people joining us on Facebook Live as well. So um, good. Yeah, very welcome to this event. Um, this is a Fellowship of the Trees event. Um, how to set up a community tree nursery. So I thought I'd just repeat that just uh, in case you've logged on to the wrong event, th thought you were going to be somewhere else. Um, so this is <laughs> how to set up a community tree nursery. Uh, and hopefully we will have lots of great information to enable you um, to do that or to uh, continue the journey if you've recently set up a community tree nursery. Um, my name is Andy Egan, and I'm one of the directors of the Fellowship of the Trees. Um, we're a young community interest company. Um, we were just sort of formally founded last year. And our mission is to connect communities to regenerate and restore healthy, abundant landscapes. And collaboration is really at the heart of what we do. And that's what motivated us to create this space this evening to bring together community tree nurseries with years, even decades, multiple decades um, of experience um, and to bring them together with emerging um, community tree nurseries. And we also hope new ones that might emerge after this event. Um, and we want to start the event this evening um, by giving two community tree nurseries the opportunity to share their stories. And they will then be joined on a panel um, by members from two other community tree nurseries. And we think it's important to have a panel with a diverse range of community tree nurseries, because one thing that that I learned when we um, first met with these wonderful people is that every tree nursery is unique and different in its own way, both in terms of its location, in terms of its structure and the people that are involved. So we wanted to kind of provide that richness um, because if you're in the process of setting up your own tree nursery, that's going to be your own journey that hopefully can be informed and um, you know, lessons can be learned from, from those that have kind of walked the path before us over the last decades. And I'm really, really grateful um, to um, our speakers and panel members uh, for, for joining us and being so willing to share their learning and their experience um, that they've gained um, with their community tree nurseries. And then it's very much over to you to ask your questions and in what we hope will be a really fruitful um, discussion with the panel. Um, could I ask um, everybody to switch off your own audio um, until it comes to perhaps when you're asking a question at the, the, the panel Q&A session. Um, and as our um, two speakers share their stories, uh, Kate and Chris, please could you write any quest your question in the chat box? Um, or if you're on the Facebook live stream in the comment section. Um, and then when we come to the question answer section, we'll go to each question in turn and we'll invite you to ask your question to the panel so that there can be uh, a kind of conversation around your question or questions. Um, we are expecting up to sort of 50 people to join us. So we are going to try and make sure that everyone, uh, you know, it has a turn and gets an opportunity to ask a question if possible. Um, and to start with, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our first speaker, who is Kate Davis from uh, Koydenvach uh, Community Tree Nursery, which is on the Gower Peninsula in South Wales. And, and uh, Kate is the nursery manager, and she's been involved in various capacities all the way uh, since 2010. So um, I'm delighted to introduce and welcome Kate and invite her to share her story with us. Over to you, Kate. Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, as Andy said, I'm Kate. And um, Coidenvach is based down in South Wales. Um, 
and it's on a track going down to a beautiful cove um, just on the right hand side and a little valley which means it's quite sheltered it gets the sun beautifully so there is some shade for the for the trees and volunteers and um but it also gets some sun it started off in 2008 and i wasn't involved at the very beginning when um some like-minded people got together and realized that um one of them was an arboriculturalist and realized that there was no outlet for bare root um, trees, native trees, were for sort of 45 miles in the area, and it meant a lot of travelling, and um, with a lot of woodland and such around us, um, there seemed, you know, there seemed to be a need for um, a nursery selling bare root trees for woodland planting. So um, a few people got together and um, started collecting um, native tree seed and sort of starting it off in their back gardens and you know it, on their own pieces of land and started looking for some land for the nursery. So they came across. So this was 2008, and they found a plot in this plot that I'm talking about in 2009. And um, it was very, it had previously historically been an old farm field where it had been used for growing potatoes. Um, clay soil, quite stony, but um, as everyone knows, clay is, you know, quite nutritional as well. And um, the undergrowth had to be cut back and the brambles. Um, I wasn't involved in all this hard work, but a lot of mattocks were involved in sort of getting up the brambles and then a rotavator was used in order to make the, um, some raised beds. Um, the beds were raised slightly, that allows for some, um, I don't mean sort of wooden sided raised beds, but the bed was just sort of raised with some raised soil with paths at the side. Paths were made, were made sort of to enable a wheelbarrow to go between the beds and generally there's a sort of slight slope so um the tree beds are sort of on a sort of terrace but wasn't a steep slope so um gradually the trees well i've come i've got back got to the part of the undergrowth being cut back so a rotavator was then used actually to rotivate the beds before the earth was piled up i forgot to say that so um, the trees were then planted in the beds from the people's gardens when they were at a sort of um, reasonable size. And um, people sort of, they started applying for small little grants. B&Q gave a little tool grant for some tools and Fisker's tools as well. And this was just sort of people writing and asking you know, if, um, you know, they they could have this from the local stores. And um, I started volunteering in 2010. It was actually a work placement to do, um, sort of connected to a horticultural course. And um, volunteered for two years with them. In the meantime, we were sort of setting up more beds. And somebody in the background was applying for um, a big lottery fund grant which we actually got in 2012. Um, this was 120,000 pounds over three years, which enabled them to take on a full-time nursery coordinator. And I applied for the post and um, I became the nursery coordinator. Um, the, this grant really was a, a great springboard for the tree nursery. Um, it had a training element in it, it had a schools element in it, which meant and we were able to offer training in seeds, um, seed sowing and soil nutrition and um, sort of just growing trees from seed and such and um, getting the community involved. So school groups came down and um, I um, I contacted the local job centre and they were sending groups down um, just to give them some work experience. The local horticultural college that I had links to through my previous training 
um, sent groups down on work experience. And um, so that all helped with, with the workforce. During that time, I was 37 and a half hours a week, which was, um, I'm now only 15 hours. So that was quite a luxury to be able to spend five days a week um, doing all this. Um, and schools were sending us lo lots of pupils of all ages and, um, of, you know, other community groups, which helped. Um, during this time, there was, Somebody else, that, um, someone working five hours a week as project support, doing a lot, some of the admin. And then we had somebody helping us out with the working stuff in the office. And we also had an office um, in a building about a mile away from this field because we didn't have a post box or anything like that for all mail to go to and, you know, sort of correspondence like that. So, um, the rest of the manpower came from our marvellous volunteers. And, um, you know, that's, um, you know, I'm the only paid, work. you know, I was the only sort of paid worker on the ground. And there's an awful lot of hard work over the years put in by volunteers of all ages. We encouraged, um, we, we purposely had our nursery times between half past nine in the morning and perhaps one for the general volunteering sessions, which meant mums could come down or dads with young children so they could get involved. Um, the site is pretty safe with um, sort of fencing all around. And um, it, we just sort of grew from there really. And um, people did come and get in touch. Um, our customer base is very, very varied. So, um, our local council, Swansea City Council, have been very, very helpful to us. They, they have a very proactive nature conservation team who would sort of promote us and for any planting or anything that they were doing would use us if possible. Um, I have contacted the Forestry Commission and have, um, was shown by um, somebody connected to them how to, to um, get local provenance standing. Local provenance is where um, the, the tree seed that you have collected is, it comes from the local area. The local provenance area connected us is quite wide and we just sort of generally go within the, um, I don't know, probably about 20 miles at the maximum collecting seed. And um, there's quite a, procedure involved with this you have to um, notify um, fill in a form for intention to collect seed in various places um, obviously um, contact the landowner quite often it's the council or um, not, you know a lot of um, landowner around us is natural resources Wales and um, get their permission or the you know the woodland trust to collect that seed and um, so you've completed your intention to collect seed form, send that off to the Forestry Commission. And then when you have collected your seed, um, fill out another form, which gives the um, weight of the tree seed that you have collected. And they then give you a cert certification to say that um, your trees are um, of local provenance, which, um, We've always promoted that message of local provenance trees. They, um, you know, far too many trees are imported at the moment, which has brought in tree diseases from, you know, ash dieback is the typical one that people are talking about. Um, that's come over from the continent. I don't really realise, sort of know why we had to import ash because it grows quite well here. And, um, Local provenance trees are genetically wired to cope with the local conditions that that tree is grown in. So um, I spoke to a farmer once from Her um, who bought trees to plant in the Gower Peninsula in Wales from Hereford, and they were just getting thrashed because he was planting them on the cliff top by the salt air. Now, if he probably had bought trees which from seed of trees growing on that, you know, in that salty environment, 
they would have been genetically stronger to cope with um, that weather condition. Also, Wales is very wet and the pollination times of the trees are in sync, you know, with, you know, the, the local trees that they're going to be pollinating with when they grow up. So I've always pushed that message um, and um, pe people seem to agree with that. And um, our customer base has just grown and grown really. Um, we have, you know, I grow, I, send us, I sell trees sort of maybe five or 10 bare root tree whips or, um, you know, quite a few more. Um, to sort of mass wood, you know, to sort of woodland planting, and um, it varies. There's other organisations in the area, such as the Woodland Trust, the Wildlife Trust, and um, sort of um, outdoor, even outdoor sort of visitor attractions and such, where they plant trees and such. They'll get in touch with us. So it's also sort of promotion and getting yourself known and everything. Um, I get um, bark chip from local tree surgeons and quite frequently when they, you know, they're involved with taking trees down, um, somebody wants to replant or something, you know, it's the trees might be diseased or anything like that. So it's good for them to have my contact as well. Um, funding has been an issue since 2015 because the big lottery funding that I talked about was um, until 2015 and um, I'm now down to 15 hours a week and my funding, you know, um, and I have other jobs now as well because funding can be up and down. Um, that can, you know, that can be a bit of a problem. Um, but you know volunteers are strong and wanting to come um the more days you can open the better but you obviously need staff in order to um encompass and you know the you know the volunteer time and such into helping with the trees um so that's that's us really um we yes so it's 2021 now and um we are we are getting sort of just getting more and more well known in the area more people are finding out about us and um you know just hoping to grow from there really um yes so um i'd be happy to answer any questions um later on and uh, i think that's me Thank you, Kate. Uh, but do you have some uh, photos of the tree nursery to share with us? Yes. Now, this I forgot to mention the apple trees. That was, yes, we also graft apple trees. I'm, I'm glad you showed that picture because it's a picture of our grafted trees. Um, we've got an orchard at the nursery and um, I buy in rootstocks and graft trees. So this is a picture of our volunteers quite recently checking over the, um, the tree grafts. When um, you graft a tree, the, you want to remove any growth from the rootstock. So all the energy goes into the scion that you've grafted onto the tree. And um, I think that's what we're doing. Um, so that would have been a sort of sunny April day quite recently when um, we're looking over those trees. They're in pots. Um, you, you can plant your grafts out, outdoors, but I tend to mollycoddle them for a little while and pop them in pots until um, they're stronger. This is a bed of our trees um, growing. And um, when you plant the trees next to each other, people sometimes sort of think, oh, you know, a tree needs lots of space. The term is lining out. When you line out the tree bed, you sort of put the trees in about um, six inches apart 
And um, the idea is that they grow up as a straight whip rather than feathering. And then when you dig them up and replant them, they then, um, that's when they start to feather. So you can see the trees are quite, in the nursery beds, they're quite close together. But, um, you know, they, when you dig them up and replant, they will then branch. Um, this is a photograph of um, our root trainers. After we've collected the seed, root trainers is sort of like a, like a sort of multi-moduled egg box really, but it's a bit larger as you can see from the picture. So it's got lots of little modules all attached and um, we'll pop the seed into that and it just gives it some protection. Um, they're quite long because trees like to put out a bit of a taproot and such. So this is a um, sort of the root trainers on the ground with um, volunteers filling them up, I think, and um, popping seed into. Quite an old picture that is. Sorry, Kate, I just want to check. Can, can people see the photos okay? I think yeah. someone suggested that they can't see them. Yeah, they're the a little box. bit blurry. I'm trying to make out, yes, this picture is making steps. I mentioned that the, yeah, the pictures are a bit blurry, I could, but you, this is um, us making steps because the um, nursery's on a bit of a slope um, going up to the shelter. So, um, yes. I'm struggling to make this out. Um, I think this is another picture of our root trainers with um, people planting seed into it. And it looks as if it might be a school group, actually. Um, I, children, a lot of, um, one of the tasks when the school groups come down actually is um, putting acorns into the root trainers. It's a job that um, the primary school children love to do. And uh, I, I love doing that with them because um, it, it sort of put the acorns sometimes have started putting a taproot out and um, they, they can see it starting to grow. And the results with, especially with acorns are, are quite quick. This, I think, is a very rainy day to, in Wales um, with us making a tree bed. <laughs> and I think that's back to the uh, picture of the tree grafts. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kate. That was okay. Thank you, Andy. I'm, I can see there's quite a few questions coming in. So when we when we start the panel discussion, we'll you've definitely got some uh, questions. So you can have a look and prepare your answers for those. But okay. Thanks Thank so you. much for sharing thanks. that story. And um, next, I'm delighted to introduce Chris Perry, who is from the Special Branch Community Tree Nursery in Brighton. And Special Branch has been running, I believe, for some 24 years now. Uh, founded in 1997 um, and Chris himself has been a volunteer there for more than a decade I believe so um, over to you Chris and I'm delighted that we now have you on screen um, after a earlier <laughs> technical oh problems where we could only hear you but it's great to be able to see you. Can well. you hear me? Yes you can hear you as well Chris. Oh it, good. The floor is yours or the screen is yours. Fantastic. Um, Hello everyone, I'm Chris Perry from Special Branch Tree Nursery and I'm the only one of four founder members who continues to work there. I will talk about how we set up the nursery and some aspects of its management. We're a small setup run entirely by volunteers which meets every Friday. Special Branch was established almost 24 years ago in 1997. I was there then. Um, it's a, it's a member of Stammer Organics, which is an organically based consortium of 17 projects situated on the outskirts of Brighton. 
um, on chalk uh, dip slope of the South Downs and it's within the national park. We grow around 25 species of local native trees and hedgerow shrubs sourced from Sussex seeds producing around 1400 whips a year, preferably for environmental and wildlife projects. Plants include local nature reserves, community and environment groups, South Downs National Park Authority, uh, wildlife trusts, allotments, schools, and small woodlands, small woodlands. The income from sales covers our running costs, which is rent, membership, materials, and volunteer expenses. I've been, a, I've been passionate about nature and wildlife from a very early age, being brought up in a North Downs village with extensive local biodiversity. Ponds, streams and oak woods on one side of the village and beech woods and chalk downland on the other side. These were our playgrounds. While working in film animation in London, wildlife was the focus of my travels and spare time. Moving to Brighton in the mid 80s expanded my passion for nature and environmental issues, including time to study horticulture and joining some BTCV natural break nature conservation holidays. I was greatly inspired by volunteering on a three month chimpanzee and primate rainforest project in Uganda. And in New Zealand, I volunteered for the Department of Conservation on Tiri Tiri Island, a small bird sanctuary and big tree nursery. I joined Brighton BTCV Midweek Conservation Group in the mid 90s, where I met three other dedicated conservationists who were interested in setting up a local tree growing project as we realized there was a demand for tree whips around the Brighton area. In 1997, Sarah Evans, the chief instigator of Special Branch, fortunately discovered some rentable land for growing projects, 18 acres or seven hectares, uh, being some council ex parks department land, which had been abandoned when Mrs. Thatcher privatized all UK council services around 1990. Very sad that happened. So a special branch was established and Stammer Organics was formed as the umbrella company to obtain the lease from Brighton Council. There were about seven potential growing groups at first, such as permaculture group, veggie box scheme, compost project. Stammer Organics is a limited company run on cooperative lines. Um, we are in fact um, we started as a nature conservation group, but we are officially at the moment an unincorporated constituted group. Um, we started in the autumn of 1997. Our third of an acre plot was completely overgrown. Uh, we're on the chalk dip slope of the South Downs facing south about 100 metres up ideal location for a, a vineyard actually but um it's 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 very sunny and sometimes it's difficult because we've got raised beds and that was that's the, the thing i would probably change in the future um we added additional projects at the time uh, green woodworking with a hazel coppice a wildflower meadow a small orchard and a pond that year, two of us joined a BTCV natural break, collecting and processing native trees in the Lake District, where we learned many valuable techniques. Within two years, we cleared enough land to construct one raised bed from reused wood with excellent compost from our neighbor's composting scheme. There were scant tree growing resources then, so we used an old out of print, but very informative local tree growing book to guide us. We used our refrigerators for stratification. Um, local provenance and bare rooted practice is fundamental to our project. Local origin means that trees are more likely to survive, thrive, reproduce successfully and reach maturity. Plants are better adapted to soil and climate, can develop more re resistance to indigenous foreign pests and diseases. The flowering, leafing and fruiting of local origin trees is better synchronized with the requirements of local fauna, particularly insects and birds. Environmentally, local provenance makes the least carbon footprint and contributes to sustained biodiversity. The advantage of bare rooted over container growing means there's less water consumption involved 
they can grow better root systems, there are no container costs, and they're easier to transport. Planting in pots tend to bonsai. Um, until the year 2000, we just funded the project ourselves until we got our big breakthrough, which was um, a grant. Um, I ran the BTCV mid midweek group and my line, line manager suggested natural pioneers grant uh, lottery funded. It's a maximum of 4,500 pounds each, but it wasn't based on the group. It was based individually. So the four of us combined resources and I suppose we spent about 15,000 pounds, which is a lot of money and it really set us up. So we got tools, rabbit fencing, pond liner, polytunnel cover, you know, raised bed material, clothing, books. And the funders encouraged education. So I, I luckily traveled around the UK and doing some impressive courses in fundraising, composting, tree management and computers. But the gem of the grant was a, a job shadowing um, at an established tree nursery at Clandy Boy Estate uh, near Bangor in Northern Ireland. It was run by the Conservation Volunteers of Northern Ireland, which is now TCV. And the four of us job shadowed there for a few days. We learned our still current stratification system. They had uh, sort of cold frames, um, filled with soil and they put the, the processed seeds into bags in a small amount of soil, about one to one. Um, and that used the natural process of a warm period in the autumn and um, a cold period in winter. So we learned more about seed processing techniques as well there. Um, the, the whole coal frame business sort of regulates the temperature better because we were putting stuff in our fridge and and it was no better than using the, the coal frame um, method. Also through the grant, we used an expert consultant from Forest Research. Um, he he was great. He just uh, we were planting our stratified our, our chitting seeds as they call them in February, March, straight into the ground um, because we're totally bare rooted. And um, we said we're not getting any germination. And he just looked at the ground and pulled up half seeds that had been opened up by rodents. And he said that the first night we planted them, they would just be demolished then. So that was really useful. So we used seed boxes from them. It was a quite tall um, seed trays. You know, they're about, I don't know, um, 30 centimeters tall. We just re reused um, boxes and crates. Um, so he taught us that and the pest control about covering up the, the, the boxes with very fine wire netting. And then he recommended shade netting for our nursery beds, which we plant out from the seed trays in about May, June. So they only have about three months of growth. And so they're very susceptible, little babies, and shade netting really helps run a south facing chalk slope and it nets by about 50%. Um, and it nets for the, you know, we get a lot of wind damage as well as sun, it's, it's equal to sun. So it helps to keep the wind out. So our grant was crucial to our survival. Since then, we have continually discovered and developed um, the Good Seed Guide which I was published in 2001 by the Tree Council, I feel is the essential guide. So we all use it and I would recommend it to everybody. Um, Stem Organics had to join the Soil Association about 12 years ago because using the name organic means we have to officially be registered. This is a bit of a pain because of records, very strict records, but we don't necessarily, we were organic anyway but um, it's quite expensive to, to do the registering, but I think it, it, it definitely benefits a lot of groups on stem organics. And it you know, keeps us in, in touch with things. Um, I've learned loads, um, narrow windows of opportunity for all seasonal tasks are sort of fundamental and nature is in, in control. 
and we only have tiny little gaps to do things and we have to be on the ball all the time. Um, I've had lots of experience in, the, in managing the tree nursery, organic horticulture, uh, collecting. We take records going way back to um, 2000. So we can um, look at locations and um, collecting times and look at the success of those results. And it does help us to you know, collect, you know, and go back to different locations. Um, and it's good to know the germination percentage we get. Um, processing, uh, we've learned fine tuning about individual species. Um, they, they sometimes require certain techniques. Um, and then, you know, we've had to deal with pest control, water collection, mulching, composting, fertilizing, and we use a lot of free liquid nettle and comfrey manure. We are dependent on volunteers totally. It's not particularly secure for, um, because numbers fluctuate, you know, can't rely all the time. Uh, there's more at the moment for the last 15 months because they can't go on holiday so much. Um, and handing over the whole project is, is, can be, could be quite difficult, um, you know, just on a volunteer basis. Um, and we have to strike a balance between how many trees we collect and how many volunteers, average volunteers, we have at the time. And they fluctuate so much. Some people stay one session. Some people stay a few years, are the current ones, and some people around average about six months. Um, amazingly, we don't need to advertise for clients, only for more volunteers. We have a website and an open day, which keeps everyone informed as to what we're doing. Um, what would I have changed? Um, I think the structure, we needed a better structure like um, community interest company, perhaps. Um, I possibly wouldn't have used raised beds for the two-year-olds because if you're going to add a lot of manure, they'll overflow. So we're quite limited, you know, and raised beds and chalk, they drain really quickly. Um, even, the, I mean, chalk is about nine inches down. Um, so, you know, when it's raining, the trees love it. Um, and I'd probably think about having the ratio between trees and fallow a bit greater. So, I mean, I'd, pro I'd probably have a ratio of half fallow, half half trees. And so that every year you, you're going into uh, somewhere you put green manure. So just to wind up, um, I would advise um, you get some land, um, if you can get some security, um, maybe join an existing established appropriate organization, local council, wildlife trust, um, conservation group, friends of group. Um, but as a community, you could just combine all your gardens together, you know, like what, ha what happened um, with the Welsh group. I mean, that, that would be great. You know, that's real community. Um, I'd be very clear on your final location of, tri of trees. You know, what are they for? It's interesting to find, you know, discuss that. And remember that it's usually at least 40 years for optimum carbon dioxide absorption. absorption. Can't say that word. Um, so maybe consider wildlife habitats for, for trees are more urgent. Um, sort out your administrative structure, a community interest company, I think would be advisable nowadays. It wasn't um, going in 1997. Um, and be sustainable if you can. Uh, I think regeneration was, was the new word last week in the media for sustainability, but we know what I'm talking about. Water collection, alternatives to plastic, rotation, soil improvement, green manures, um, thinking about wildlife, you know, we have a half our plot, almost half our plot is, is um, designated to wildlife. And I think about I, um, areas on your plot where you can plant 
um, insect supporting plants, nectar food plants, because they're declining at such a rate. I mean, good to just add a bit of that and, and think climate change, you know, lift sharing, cycling. I mean, 20 years ago, we were told that beach was moving further north because of climate change, because they've got very shallow roots. But I haven't noticed much difference. And we don't know what our climate is going to be like, you know, mm. tomorrow almost. So, um, and reuse, recycle. And I feel that local provenance is is a good idea um resources um chris um do you have some photos to share with us i do yeah yeah we've it's shared that that's great and... see the good seed guide we've the, i think a couple of us have shared the link in the chat box to the good seed guide already yeah i put um, um our friendly technician has put them in two links i sent in yeah um, uh, one one was um, forest research PDF and another was a TV TCV website. But we've got the link to the Good Seed Guide. I looked online. There's 196 left today. Twenty four <laughs> pounds, and it's recommended for everyone. Yeah, I've got some few photos. I'll be quick. Oh, this is this is in the early days before um, digital photography. It was it was just after color photography had been invented. <laughs> and that's our plot. Um, it was ex council parks department, and we had to cut down rows of really attractive Dar uh, Berberis darwinii, unfortunately. Um, the next pictures um, are of similar, of uh, very early stages. And our, on the right is our first um, bed, our first nursery bed. And what's next, I wonder, I can't remember. Oh yeah, this is, a, this is a view of nowadays. So at the foreground, there's the two three-year-old trees, some of them growing, and in the background, there's the nursery beds. And in the next, oh, it's hedges as well. We, we have a lot of hedges on our site. We grew them from 1997, um, from hawthorn saplings growing on our site. And we put our, all our own trees in. We've got mixed, mixed hedges of all our own trees. This is our nursery bed, so they're, they're narrow, easy to work with, about a meter apart. This is planting out in May, June. Uh, the next picture is more nursery beds. Uh, actually, the only thing we put in containers is the yew and holly, which are at the front here. But they yeah, don't like it, you know, uh, but they don't like being bare rooted there. They've set down tap roots. And if you go to a tree, a tree nursery, all yew and holly is in, in containers. The next picture is of our stratification boxes, reusing old um, um, cold water tanks. And this is the final picture. This is our stratification box opened. The, the bags and the seed uh, boxes on the, on the right in the winter. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the show. That's brilliant, Chris. Thanks so much. Um, I really think that uh, you and Kate and I know the couple of uh, panel members are going to introduce now. I think we could be producing a new book, the, the Good Community Tree Nursery Guide um, to, to, for future generations. So um, maybe that's something uh, our friends at the Tree Council might like to collaborate on because um, I know there's a few who've joined us today. Um, Brilliant. So now um, we're going to introduce, um, <clears throat> following uh, Kate and Chris's excellent uh, presentations, um, the other three members who are going to join the panel uh, from two more tree nurseries. So first, I'd like to invite um, Marcelo and Anne from the uh, Tree Musketeers, which is in Hackney in London, to quickly introduce themselves. Over to you. Uh, is Marcelo there? Yeah, yeah, he is. I am. Um, yeah, so we've had a community tree nursery in Hackney for 20 years and mainly grow trees for the council to plant in our parks and green spaces. Um, we are a bit different because we focus on, because we're in the southeast, we focus more on 
drought tolerant species and more and less native species actually so we do things completely different to how everyone else does it um and yeah annie annie's been around a lot longer than me in the nursery so she's she's been um been sort of spearheading it since since the beginning almost yeah all right yeah the, the tree nursery was started up just around 2000 by it was it was the user group um for hackney marshes and um a guy a guy from groundwork who is now actually the uh, tree officer for Hackney, which is quite handy. Um, and there was a, a potting green that was um, not being used because council couldn't afford to pay for staff. And it was a bit, bit of spare land. And um, it was suggested that it was used to actually create a tree nursery. So that's the site that we've got. Uh, a site, if it hadn't become a tree nursery, it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist now, it would be under under tarmac because uh, we have had various offers for <laughs> taking that land away. Um, so basically Hackney Marshes is, is on two meters worth of um, bomb rubble from the Blitz. Um, and so the tree, the, the tree nursery, the, well, we, we actually, everything we plant is in, everything we grow is in pots. Um, and we're now using air pots, which uh, some people might be familiar with, but they're, they're, um, they do enable us to grow, grow on trees quite a bit without having to keep repotting them. Um, the site is, has just been developed over the years by, by volunteers. We've never had any paid staff. Um, there was a, a grant at the very beginning, which allowed the, the tools and the containers and the polytunnels to be set up and and then over the years different people came along and had different ideas about what what how we did stuff there um i started the a forest garden in 2007 uh on an area that was just ex putting green which just flat flat short cut grass um now looks somewhat different um, and everything we do there is to encourage biodiversity so um, we do it's 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 quite a special place given that it is just like on the very edge of Hackney Marshes and um, you know next to a very busy road but everybody that comes onto the site is quite um, surprised at what what there is there so part of the site is used for growing trees um, which are in pots and the rest of the site is left as wild as possible actually and um and we over the years different species have been planted which um are now self-seeded and self all over the place so you never know what's going to come up every year um anyway so that's how Liam. that's how we got set up yeah thank, thank you Anne. that's great to have that quick overview of uh, um <laughs> the tree musketeers and, and your and your no it was a nursery plus you've got so much so much else going on there it's fantastic <laughs> And um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Adam, who's from Moor Trees in Devon, who's briefly going to tell us about Moor Trees. Over to you, Adam. Many thanks. Yep. Yeah, um, so, Adam, I'm the current director of Moor Trees, have been since 2018. Moor Trees was established back in 2000 as a charity and limited company, set up in much the same way um, that Chris's and Kate's nurseries did, it started small multiple sites growing in people's back gardens, allotment plots and so forth. I think something um, that more trees took as a strategy in its early days was to apply for grants so we could always have some staff paid and weren't wholly reliant on volunteers. And with that strategy, um, that has meant that what we've done is we have consolidated those smaller tree nurseries. We now focus on two tree nurseries. And, and we've been about growing more and more trees. So currently we're growing about 25,000 trees a year, all native British broadleaf. Um, we were very fortunate last year, we went in with Tree Council on a partnership project funded by the National Lottery um, for the Close the Gap project, which was all about hedgerows. And that got us quite a significant grant. So this last year for us has been about expansion. It's been about 
more staff, it's been about trainees, it's been uh, about improving all of the infrastructure across the tree nurseries. So next year we'll be operating at quite, quite a big scale with about 50,000 trees ready and um, growing in across both tree nurseries each year. Um, but those trees will only ever be about two years old. So we don't do big trees, we do small trees. Um, the other thing which has been talked about is a good seed guide, and I can um, very pleased to tell Andy and Chris with the Tree Council, we're working with the Tree Council and we're producing um, and enhancing that guide with video productions and also um, a digital guide, which will be available um, in the early part of next year. So that bit about education and, and engagement and encouraging people to, to begin their community tree nurseries, no matter what scale, whether it be a treetop tree nursery or, or a much bigger and more ambitious scale, um, hopefully there'll be information within that to, to, to help you all. But I think for, for me, um, my background is in forestry and arb, but I, I, I've never done a tree nursery in my life. I've, you know, I, 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 I've never, never worked in one um, until I came to more trees and uh, it's exceptionally rewarding, it's great fun, engaging the local communities, totally reliant on volunteers, even though we do have permanent staff um, and, 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 and we're busy every single week collecting seed through the, through the season and growing it and so forth. So I would heartily recommend to anybody who's in the forum today to uh, you know, be ambitious and, and start. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Adam. That was a nice way to, to wrap up the contribution. So you see, we've got a fantastic panel of people ready to answer your questions. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll take questions that have been posted in the chat first. And then we'll, if we get through those, we'll kind of open the floor as well to anybody to, to come in. So first question we've got is from Julie Lear, if you're still with us. Do you want to come in and ask your question? Julie? Hi, hi. I can't actually remember what, unless I see them in the chat. Oh, it was about it. it was local provenance. Yes. yes. So yeah, um, from local gardens. It was really more that in my area, what I've asked people to do is just save seedlings. So you haven't got the official local provenance as in documented, but is that good enough? I, they were going to pot them on for me in the winter, and then I was going to look after them and pass them on to projects. Would that be acceptable? Kate, do you? Yes, I, I don't mind. Um, I'll answer that one. Um, I talked about the process for getting local provenance. And do, do you know what? Nobody has ever, ever asked me for a certificate um, for local provenance. And um, it's, it's just people will ask for locally grown trees. So I'm sure that if a customer was to ask and you were to say where, you know, where the trees come from, that would be acceptable for them because all the um, um, the benefits of local provenance are, you know, present in those. There, there might be a little bit of sort of a grey area where the, the, the tree that provided the seed and such might have been import, you know, might have come from somewhere else and everything. But when you collect from woodland, you don't really know that. Um, we haven't got any sand trees. The Forestry Commission sort of talk about sand trees. We haven't got any in our area um, and there aren't that many. So, um, you know, with regards to sort of just telling people where they come from, I'm sure that would be fine. Um, and they're locally grown, aren't they? Yeah. Anyone else on the panel want to come in on the local provenance? Had any experience in that area? Adam? I think Kate you summed it, summed it up ideally it's just that um, you don't know where the tree came from where the seeds come from you know so it could be a local uh, tree or it could be one that's kept it imported and it could be some sort of hybrid specialized you have to you have to look at it very carefully and just it is naturalized to the area so I don't see a problem yeah. Adam, did you have a quick comment? Um, I, I've sort of struggled with this one because we get offered lots of trees from around people who've grown them in the gardens. And, and as a registered tree nursery um, with the UK now and Source and Growth Through the Woodland Trust, we can't accept them because of this issue of uh, forest, uh, the rules and regulations with forest reproductive materials. 
but there are lots of people out there who are growing trees and picking seed up in their woodlands and growing them on and wanting to pass them on and pass them forward. Uh, and I think it's something that the industry actually has to look at wider because you could quite easily argue if you pick up an oak tree in your local woodland, grow it in your garden and plant it back out, biosecurity issues aren't, aren't, aren't there and they're not that significant because it's only a handful of trees. And potentially, as you say, when you're growing many, many, many trees in one small location, commercially almost, then, then the biosecurity issues are more of a problem. But it, it, I think it is a challenge that needs to be considered and I don't have an answer for it, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'll move on to our next question. It's uh, Jeannie. I think you had a couple of questions for, for Kate about um, species being grown and income um, from tree, tree sales. Are you still with us, Jeannie? Yes, I am. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Was Welcome. Hi. Um, I think... That question has sort of been answered by some of the other speakers, but I am quite interested in the, uh, the range of species. Um, listening to Annie, um, she's got a forest garden where you get quite a range of different species. And um, we've got likewise at our very new nursery in Suffolk. Um, so I'm just interested really thinking about climate change and preparing for different different conditions that I would have thought diversity is a really important issue so that uh, we can face whatever comes our way. For example, I've, I've had some really interesting things that have survived in Suffolk this year through um, what's been a very wet winter, then we go into drought. We've had some frosts that have taken a lot of the fruit. But on the other side, we've had very good yields of um, hazels and quince and, and gauges, where in other years the apples um, have dominated. Just interested in, in anybody's views really on that. Who would like to respond to that one? I'm well, I just... Sorry, um, sorry Marcel, you can. No, I, I mean, go, go through about the forest garden first, then I'll just talk about... Um, plant like city planting sorry what i say talk answer about oh, the forest sorry, garden sorry, sorry, and then i was going to say okay. something about city okay. planting yeah no i uh, the the plants a lot of the plants that we got for the for the forest garden for the agroforestry unit and uh, they're they're, they're they're not all you know they're not native necessarily they're species that will grow in our changing in our changing climate and that's and that's what we've gone for um a lot of the trees that we get aren't aren't are um some you know some are just given to us because people don't know what to do with them or they order them because they get them for free from the tree you know from the um oh whichever project does it in the winter um and people order trees and then don't know what to do with them and so we we get them. Um, so we we and we rescue trees from other sites. So in London there are all sorts of trees growing, as, as particularly in Hackney. Hackney is very rich in a number of very unusual trees um, in our streets, and um, and that's where we get the, the trees from. But I mean I think you know we've got to think about changing climate, especially in London. We you know we've had it for a long time. It's you know, the urban heat island, and now. The climate is, I mean, it's making itself very, um, <laughs> very evident that things are changing and changing fast. So uh, we've just got to adapt to that as best we can. Yeah, what I was going to say is that in London, we're basically planting in a non-native environment. In any city, it's a non-native environment. And us planting native trees, they actually struggle a lot more in the parks than non-native trees. Um, so to be honest, what we what we concentrate on is diversity. And because the parks have a lot of compaction, a lot of footfall, a lot of like pollution near them. Native trees like Rowan and Hazel and some stuff just don't, they don't like it anymore. Um, 
in certain places like the marshes, which is more, it's like by the river, it's a um, wildlife corridor. There we'll concentrate more on native trees, but apart from that, non-native trees are actually what we're looking at more because they they survive and they will be able to survive a lot longer, really. Okay, thanks, Masa and Annie, for responses to that one. Um, the next question we've got is from Mark Shipperley. Um, who actually asked a couple of questions, so over to you, Mark. You're on mute, by the way. Just... Lovely. Thanks for that. It was just to get an idea, especially from Coiden Fach, which interesting, I grew up in Wales anyway, in the Gower, um, and got all my tree mm -hmm. passion from there. But um, whether they're breaking even, what the sort of costs are, and how that's all balancing out as a, as a business? Um, it, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, we, are t we are very reliant on um, grants. Um, we don't have enough income from selling the trees. Um, in order to um, sort of co cover um, my, my salary or some of the others. So we are quite grant reliant. And um, we've gone through some dips where I ended up really having to sort of do a lot of volunteer work on an unpaid basis and, and such. So um, we, I, don't, I don't think we could ever manage our overheads with the... Um, income from the trees, um, especially as we host school groups and um, the like in, you know, in, and involve them in some of our tr tree production. You know, in some ways it's a quite a sort of unique selling point, the fact that a lot of my um, acorns are sown by children and people love that idea, but it takes a far more resources and such in order to manage that and do that so we, we don't break even we we need grant funding okay uh, no, that's, that's interesting. So basically uh, your outputs aren't just the trees it's actually the education process and everything that's, yes that's a good point that's correct yes okay. um you know the, the, the number of school children that can't even name me one type of tree or anything like that yeah. and you, you, you know is um it, it, well um, it doesn't surprise me anymore but um you know, so yeah, the output is about the education and just sort of showing people, you know, about that. And also volunteer health and well-being as well. There's been a lot of emphasis on that. And there's a lot of funding in that area as well. And, yeah. um, you know, that's what a lot, you know, most of our volunteers get from that. And we have mental health um, groups come down sometimes. And, um, you know, the local psychiatric hospital sends groups down you know, to, to work with us. Um, so, so yes, that's, but that's not um, an output that you can measure financially, you know, yes. Okay, and my other question was a technical one about whether you undercut roots at all. Um, that is good practice, but I don't always get round to doing it. Um, I do try to do it and, you know, so undercut the roots and then maybe move the tree to stop that tap root doing it. I don't always manage it. It depends on my volunteers at the time. And when you do that, it's a really, really busy time for us. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, in an ideal world, I, you know, I think that's, you know, that's a good idea, but I don't always manage it. Okay. No, it's great to hear your project down in the gal. So, Thanks. thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Mark. I'm going to move on to Bruce now. I think I had a, uh, also had a technical question relating to acorns. Bruce. Oh, hi there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to check if you chitted, um, chitted your acorns. Um, it was a uh, Forestry Commission workshop the other day was recommending chitting. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear Kate. Uh, does anyone... Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, no, we don't actually. Um, they manage quite well the, um, without chitting. Um, quite often, they're, you know, the and the problem is that it's a race to plant the acorns before they start putting that taproot down, um, which, you know, they'll do in the bag or, you know, any the sort of storage container and such. So I don't shit, no. Um, and it, it, I'm sort of quite interested in the fact that um, they were doing that. Yeah. The, the, can, I, can I just add the Forestry Commission were promoting uh, using root trainers because yeah. uh, you can 
uh, use the root trainers to cut the uh, uh, tap root as the, the roots coming out the bottom dry off and die so to promote side root, root growth. And then they were also promoting them because you can plant um, directly from those um, root trainers uh, during a longer season. You're not you're mm -hmm. not reliant upon the dormant season for planting. Yeah, that, that's why I love root trainers. Um, and they're also, you know, you can sort of put them up a bit because you know, the main the main problem with acorns is that pesky squirrel getting in and sort of um, feasting on them or, or maybe voles. So, um, you, you know, you can put them up and um, then when the oak is bigger, the other actually the other thing is birds sometimes can um, as the shoot starts coming up, um, birds will quite often take the shoot off as well. So, um, yeah, root trainers really good and they're plastic i'm afraid but uh, we're still using the same root trainers which um we bought initially so uh, we really have reused them and um when we're not using them store them out of sunlight because the parish is plastic and you know sort of try and look after them brilliant thank you very much adam did you want to come in on this question so you raise your hand yeah, I was just um, going to say about the, the chitting element again, we, we don't chit, what we do is we collect them when they slightly opened up and they're showing that the first root coming out um, and, and then we put them straight into root trainers and we don't grow any oak in the ground uh, for, for the pest issue. So that's uh, that sort of two tree nurseries now sort of saying definitely oak root trainers um, and, and uh, that's the way we do it. and we. We grow them very successfully, but with root trainers, you just need to watch the watering because they dry out a lot faster. Brilliant. Right, thanks, Adam. Uh, our next question's from Greg, Greg Fairley, um, touching on a few issues that we've mentioned already, I think, about local provenance and climate change. Greg, would you like to ask your question, please? Not sure he's here. <laughs> Okay, so um, Greg's question, well, we can answer if he's, if he's uh, had to leave, we, it's still an interesting question, he's asking if uh, local provenance may be affected by climate change. That may be a bit of a theoretical question, I suppose. Um, but <laughs> I don't know, Marcelo, what, what are your thoughts on, on this are, because obviously you're finding that, you know. Um, I don't know, I... Before I used to think so. I've been trying to collect seeds from quite a few ancient trees or veteran trees to like oaks from Windsor and stuff like that. But the more and more I sort of look into it, the less and less I really believe that some of these are that that provenance is like true provenance is always there because you don't know these these ancient trees could have been brought in by by a roman guy who's just who had some seeds in his pocket and just chucked them and it's like everyone does they pick up a seed sits in their pocket and then they just throw it aside it's like anyone who's interested in trees and like especially to do with the garden thing when you have trees in your garden you don't actually know where they've come from if like the per the homeowner before you just bought it from b and q and they were mass produced whips or they were given out by tcv or something you don't know exactly where they're from and even the woodlands like in london any, any tree in london i wouldn't say has any provenance because they've all most of them have been planted they're not not they're they've they haven't really been around for long enough in London to like be of true provenance or these woodlands haven't been ev around long enough. So any tree that it, it might survive better because it has that particular tree has lived in London and been able to reproduce. But for, for me in, in London, I don't believe there's anything such as true provenance. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I, like to find an actual ancient woodlands in the UK with trees that have been reproducing within themselves for, for that long, 
I'm believing is more and more difficult and it's like there's there's a certain amount of time that I think that provenance could that like we that the woodland should be considered to be there for it to be true provenance um because this one I mean, anything in London hasn't hasn't been around for a, like 200 years um and the trees that are in the parks in London they were planted um you don't know where those seeds were from and they were probably selected a lot of them from like places in France or somewhere like that that they that they were brought here because they were very good specimens um and likely imported so it really depends on where you are but then if you go to somewhere like Scotland and you're in the Caledonia forest and you're getting pines from there it's a different story those trees have been reproducing there for a long long time so it's very it's not very cut and dry it's sort of you have to really think about it if I get a tree from if I get seed from an ancient tree from Windsor I wouldn't say it's of true provenance because who knows where that tree came from I they're, they're probably all all planted um by by man I think <laughs> that's that's sort of my opinion but it's yeah yeah I think it's a lot more it's a lot bigger subject than we really think about um and there's a lot more to think about when you talk about it and how long mm. what what is actually considered true provenance because nat naturalized in the area is different and that's what I'm saying they these are trees that are trying to let seed from trees that do well but that doesn't mean they're of provenance i don't necessarily think um okay. yeah thanks for that chris do you have any thoughts on on the issue in terms of climate change and, and whether well, whether there's any dynamic, isn't yeah. it it's i mean our native if you call a, a tree native in this country it goes back to the ice age they're the trees that sort of pioneered after the last ice age and, and the UK it was separated from Europe by the English Channel. Um, I don't know if they have local provenance in Europe because they've never been sort of, I don't think they get got the ice age down there. Well, not our ice age. So it's quite, it's quite a, a sort of academic thing. And uh, um, I mean, the way um, climate change can affect local provenance is that some of these magnificent veteran trees might die. Um, and I agree with Marsh, it's like, who knows how long that tree's been there. You know, I, we grow um, trees from nature reserves and um, which, is, which, is a, which is a bit ironic that we have to actually get derogation from the Soil Association for all the trees we collect because nature reserves aren't registered with the Soil Association. Um, so we kept we collect the most mature trees we can, um, and if during the first year of growth they become a bit runty, we I, t I tend to discard them. Um, some of our volunteers don't like doing that, but it just means it's it's growing well. You know, we don't want trees that are stunted and a bit bent. You know, they won't grow to mature properly. Okay, thank, thanks, Chris. And uh, presumably that you reference the Soil Association is because you're part of Stanmer Organics and are all your trees certified, therefore, as being organic? Yeah. Um, so we've got some questions that have come in from Facebook Live, I believe. Um, so one question is, what would you say is an average germination rate? Does it depend on the species? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It's um, it, well in our case anyway. Uh, it depends where your location is, I suppose, and 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 how viable your seeds are. Um, some years we don't get a, a harvest. I mean, we haven't had beech two years now. Um, and we we keep a, a we keep a record of where we collect stuff, proximate proximate seeds are stratified and. A lot of volunteers like counting them out, you know. Um, you know, it's no point in counting out a thousand, but you know, they count out a few hundred, they count out exactly. So we know the exact germination rate. But then in the first year, quite a few die, so we can log that in. Um, 
But generally, we know the average germination rate for most of the trees we grow. And a lot of it is um, maybe 10% or 20%, but that's because we don't give them the optimum um, forest research, um, uh, warm period and cold period for stratification. And we don't, as they did in Clandiboy State, they used to uh, reduce the moisture before they would stratify them. You know, that involves getting, getting scales and samples and drying them out for a few weeks. I mean, it's very, it's very complicated. And I think they, they do it in a, a building. When we were there, they were building 20 years ago a proper stratification building where they could regulate and control all the different types of um, temperatures for the trees. Um, but yeah, I can tell you, not offhand, but you know what, what germinates really well and what doesn't. Nut, nuts tend to germinate really well. Um, going back to oaks, I mean, if you just, we don't know why you wanted to chip the oaks, but we just float them in a bucket and the floaters or put them in the bucket and the floaters get discarded. Although they will germinate on average if, if you want them to, but they mustn't dry out oaks. So you just put them in soil. Um, you don't need to strat you know, stratify outdoors, um, but they germinate really well. But things like hawthorn, which actually need an optimum, optimum times for collecting hawthorn is July, June, July. It's optimum time for starting stratification. So you'd have to collect them in October uh, process them, store them, and then stratify them, you know, so they take a year and a half. But I've tried that and it doesn't make any difference. So we just chuck them all in in October and um, we get quite a good germination rate, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30%, which is good, you know, when you, you, you know, putting 500 seeds in a seed tray. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, there's, I haven't got the figures on me if you want to know, but. Um, Sorry. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. That's 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 a really uh, helpful answer. Uh, the next question we've got is from Louise, um, who wants to ask about your top tips. Louise, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yes, hello. Hi, Lenny. Yeah, I was just going to. Um, yeah, really great, everybody. Really interesting webinar. Um, I was just going to ask the panel. They've obviously got loads of experience between them, and if you had to give new groups just starting out now your one top tip, if you could just pick one thing. Um, that you often, you know, you know, groups often get wrong when they're starting out. What would your, what would your one top tip be? Who wants to go first? Adam, go on. Um, I, I think most plants are just like us. You know, we, we, we like comfort, we like food and we like water. So um, once, once you've got your seeds, that you need to look after them. And that's, that's exactly it. Make sure that they've always um, in good compost to get them going, that they, they get the right amount of water. And if you're going to feed them, give a nice natural feed. Chris mentioned the, uh, the nettle and the comfrey works well. Uh, and once they've got going, they'll, they'll just keep going. Well, Chris, I think that's, that's, that's really fundamental advice, Adam. Um, I would watch out for pests though, um, rodents, birds, squirrels in particular, just love tree seeds. So you just have to protect all your seeds, you know, put them in places, you know, cover them with very small, small mesh wire um, and make sure that you, you keep the pests away. I mean, we don't get insect pests, it's just the rodents mainly. So you'd be disappointed if you put everything out and a lot of collecting and they all disappeared overnight, you know. Thanks, Chris. Kate, what would your top tip be? Um, this booklet from the Tree Council, I would suggest that um, anybody bought that actually, um, because it's a mine of information and gives the germination times and such for, um, each individual seed so um yeah my top tip actually would be to buy that and just start small and you know sort of you have good years for tree seed and you have bad years for tree seed and just because it's failed one year it doesn't mean to say that it's going to um it might not work the next year because 
um, you have what's called mast years where you have a lot of really good seed and then um, from a particular species and then um, that might drop off in, um, in the next year. So, um, and it, it takes a while, you know, to, to, to um, so, you know, it takes a while, it, acorns germinate pretty quickly, but there's, so there's the, some other tree seed will take a while. So patience as well, yeah. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Kate. Anne, what would your top tip be? I know, it's very, <laughs> my mind's all over the place. Um, I think, well, in, in, in terms of starting up, starting a tree, a tree nursery is, is like planning out the area and how you go, where you're going to, how you're going to use it. Um, yeah, planning, planning out, having, having, creating an area in which it's easy to work um, and move things around. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I think that's, that's my top tip. <laughs> Enough space, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, and uh, I'll move on to the next question. This is from James, um, who has a good specific question about growing rowan. Uh, James, I think you're still with us. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, yeah, I'm growing rowan for the first time this year uh, in root trainers. And where they're quite close together, when you water them because of the, the shape of their leaves, they quite often get tangled up. Um, and what I found is, unfortunately, um, that they've kind of tangled up and then without over time, they've ended up with an S curve to their stem, um, which is obviously is, is ideal. Has anybody got any tips for how to get them to grow straight and not tangle, please? How many are you growing? Uh, well, I've got them in the deep root trainers. So they come as a little pack of 32 to the, the I suppose, the, yeah, the, the group of, of root trainers. Um, but I've also got them growing in um, an air pruned, I suppose, bed that I've made up with uh, mesh underneath. So they're probably about, an inch and a half apart and I suppose you're, you're kind of stuck with the spacing with the deep root trainers um, because of the natural form that they come in. Well we don't use root trainers but um, we grow bare rooted and they're maybe six 12 inches apart um, and they grow straight up our rowan so maybe they should be grown in different containers and just spaced apart a bit, you know. That makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Are, are they getting enough light? Are they in full sun? Because why? My as soon as something's in full sun, for me, it just grows straight, bang upright. When okay. it's, if it's in the shade, then it will go and try and find something. And if, especially if it's in a pot, they get moved around different directions and they can go one way and then another way and snake around. Um, so that's one thing that I would think about. Okay. Um, there is a tree above there. I mean, they get half of the daily sun, but sometimes they're in a bit of shade. So that maybe mm -hmm. that's why they're not growing so, so straight. Okay. Thank, thanks. Great. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks James. Um, we've got, probably just a little bit of time for maybe one or two more questions from the floor if anyone would like to jump in and ask a question they think we haven't covered yet. I'm interested in compost and I wondered if anyone's growing and uh, making their own compost. Um, I've been trying to grow oats with um, in a raised bed, a mobile raised bed, and we put a layer of farmyard manure followed by some commercial compost on the top. And then I've tried different litter, leaf litter in different beds to see how they work. But we would like to have some clamps so that we can mix farmyard manure to increase the, the organic matter in the soil compost we've been receiving. Anybody got any tips? Please. Well, we've got some um, excellent compost at the tree nursery, but we just, we just, it, it's just basically made up of all the stuff that we um, that we harvest and um, grass cuttings. 
we're adding cardboard and wood chip to it and, um, and then it's left for the duration and um, yeah so it, it's been it's been really good right okay thanks I, I see Bruce has raised his hand so do you want to come back in Bruce and have another question <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to check. I bought um, edging whips before from a uh, nursery and uh, you get a bundle of about uh, uh, 30 or 50 where all the roots are entangled. So you've got to, um, you've got to untangle, you've got to uh, very carefully take them all apart. Have they been made from hardwood cuttings? And does anybody use hardwood cuttings to do that? Adam, do you want... So we do grow from hardwood cuttings, um, grow hazel, gelder rose and willow, which is an easy one to get going. Um, in terms of entanglements, we uh, have grown them bare roots and we've grown them in root trainers. So we haven't had entanglement issues because in the root trainers, obviously within their own individual container and then in the ground, they're probably about 10 centimetres, four inches apart. So we haven't had had those issues, um, but we find uh, they they all take. It's just about getting them sort of cut and uh, either in water, obviously, until you get a chance to get them into the air. But this also kind of goes back to the compost question earlier and different compost. And we've grown stuff bare root straight into air. We've grown stuff in peat free, and we've um, grown stuff in a soil and compost, pea-free compost mixture. And we've definitely found that getting things going in seed trays and getting things going to a point where the cotyledons, which are the first leaves, have gone through and they're onto the first mature set of leaves, compost is the way forward to get them going. I don't know if anyone else has had success using earth or earth and um, compost mixes, but we found that the compost and earth mix forms a real cake layer under the surface with the water in and, and, and they really struggle to get away and soil, soil itself just compacts too tightly. So we would definitely recommend compost um, and a, a good peat free compost. There are some that are better than others. If you find one has, a, has quite a high woody content, then that can be quite, quite poor nutritiously. So you need to find something with a less woody component to it. Um, but I would definitely start all seeds and seedlings in, in compost and, and hardwood cuttings as well. Once they get away, then, then you can plant them out into the bare root beds. But again, bare root beds, a lot of organic material, turn them regularly, set them to fallow. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Adam. And um, uh, I'm conscious of the time. And uh, we said we'd finish at 8.30. So um, we, we, we will aim to finish at 8.30. So I want to say... A huge thank you to Kate and to Chris and to Adam and to Marcelo and to Anne for, for sharing their knowledge and experience with us today. Um, it's been really fascinating, um, so much diversity. And I think, you know, the, the community tree nurseries are, offer so much. And, you know, a lot of people are dedicating their time voluntarily for many, many years. And you're providing, you know, a fantastic benefit not only in terms of biodiversity and trees, but also in terms of education and in terms of well-being and, and, and mental health as well. So I think there's uh, so much, there's so much richness in, in what you do. And um, yeah, I just want to say a big vote of appreciation for the fantastic work you're doing. Um, and for, for ourselves as a fellowship, we're very open to um, being here to do what we can do to help support new tree nurseries and to, you know, create opportunities for people to, to share and learn from each other. So if people have any thoughts or ideas on, on what we can do after this event or going forward, we're very open to hear from that and to um, see, you know, what, what we, can, we can offer and support to that process. Some of you may be aware that we already have a project uh, which was started by one of our wonderful directors who's with us here today, Luciana, the Tree Guardians Project. And we already have a network of people around the UK who are 
raising trees uh, from seed um, as individuals. So, um, you know, we've, we've created it as a little community and, and, and uh, network and there's a Facebook group where people can share how their, how their journey of growing native trees from, from seed is going. So for us, supporting communities to come together is, is a kind of natural growth of, of that work that, that we've started. Um, so just finally, um, you may another thing that we do, we've started recently a series of nature talks. And this is where we write, uh, invite a range of people just just to talk and to share their talks about what they're doing. So we've got our next nature talk on the 26th of August, and that's with Adrian Rook. Um, and he's going to be talking about Ockham tree wisdom. Um, so he's a, a counsellor, uh, a druid, and he, he's got a fantastic richness um, of experience and insight and ancient wisdom that he's going to uh, ancient tree wisdom that he's going to share with us on the 26th of August. I'm sure that'll be a fascinating talk. And uh, please look out for future nature talks because they're really on a diverse range of subjects. And I'm sure that there might even be somebody amongst the audience here today who would like to give a nature talk. Um, the first two nature talks are actually available on our website, so you can watch the recordings of those. And I think they're they're well well worth um, well worth a listen. So. Um, just and also a final thanks as well to uh, Talisa from Event Seven, who's ensured that the events run smoothly this evening. Um, so thanks, thanks Talisa for your work behind the scenes in making this all work uh, smoothly and properly. So um, fantastic uh, work that you've done helping helping this all run run the way it has. So Thank thanks to everyone for joining us and uh, in, enjoy, the, in, enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, we hopefully look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Okay, goodbye for now.